Baudelaire brings in a vocabulary, you know, a objects into poetry which have never been part of lyric poetry. They've been part of maybe a satiric poetry or comic poetry. Uh, it's everything from death, sex, bodily functions, squalor, evil, and these things. They exist, but they tend to exist in comedy or, or satire. He brings them into lyric high poetry. So the very vocabulary of poetry, and since words reflect things, the world that poetry reflects changes radically. But when you hear it, it sounds like the great French masters. And it's just shocking to people. Hey, everyone. You're listening to Sacred and Profane Love, a podcast in which philosophers, theologians, and literary critics discuss how literature can help us think more deeply about love, happiness, and meaning in human life. As always, I'm your host, Jennifer Frey. I'm a philosopher at the University of South Carolina, and I'm also a fellow at the Institute for Human Ecology at the Catholic University of America. As always, I'd like to thank my sponsors for their support of this podcast. First and foremost, the Institute for Human Ecology, which underwrites this podcast, The IHE is an academic institute committed to research into the conditions vital for human flourishing. To learn more about the IHE and all the events and programs that they put on, you can go to their website, ihe.catholic.edu. I'll be doing an event with the IHE December 14th with Ross Douthit about Christian nationalism, so please look out for details on that. And I'd also like to thank The Lamp and The Point magazines for underwriting my Patreon page. If you enjoy this podcast, please consider becoming a monthly patron. You can go to patreon.com slash eudaimoniapod to sign up. As a $10 monthly patron, for example, you can get a free digital subscription to either The Lamp or The Point magazines. The Lamp is a bi-monthly lay edited journal of Catholic letters that draws attention to those things that are true, good, and beautiful, whether they belong formally to the Catholic Church or not. To read some of their content, please go to thelampmagazine.com. And The Point is a magazine of philosophical writing premised on the idea that humanistic thinking has relevance for contemporary life. You can check out the latest fall issue at thepointmag.com. I'm pleased to get to episode 56 of the podcast, in which I speak with the poet and critic Dana Joya about Charles Baudelaire's famous book of poems, The Flowers of Evil. As always, I hope you enjoy our conversation. Welcome, everybody, to a really special episode of Sacred and Profane Love. We are recording here from the University of Dallas at the Catholic Imagination Conference. So I just want to say thank you to some of the people who made this event possible. First and foremost, thank you to Jessica Hooten Wilson, who organized this conference and did such an amazing job in the face of uh, strange disasters. And thanks to the University of Dallas for hosting us. And then also, I just want to thank the Institute for Human Ecology The Institute for Human Ecology at the Catholic University of America underwrites this podcast and has made my appearance here possible. I am absolutely giddy with excitement to welcome Dana Joya to the podcast, who needs no introduction and is, frankly, in my opinion, a national treasure. So thanks for coming on, Dana. I share your giddiness, (laughs) but it's at meeting you again. (laughs) Yeah, so we are going to be talking about Charles Baudelaire's The Flowers of Evil, and I've been wanting to talk about this book of poems for a long time. So let's just start with the most general and basic question, which is who was Charles Baudelaire? Uh, Charles Baudelaire is probably somebody that most literary people know about. But in America, few people know much about. Uh, So let me give you a couple of of basic facts about him. Charles Baudelaire was born uh, in Paris in 1821, and he died there paralyzed by syphilis uh, 46 years later. He was 
probably one of the two most influential poets in the world, or at least the Western world, in the late 19th century. The other being a different kind of influence, which is Walt Whitman. I, you know, what I mean by that is those were the two poets who thousands of other poets and artists found most useful for imagining themselves. Of the two, though I am an American, I tend to prefer Baudelaire for personal aesthetic reasons. What Baudelaire did, I think, was six or seven things of immense importance in the history of art. And the weirdness of Baudelaire's career is if you, okay, Whitman, you know, you could publish Whitman in volume after volume after volume, an immensely prolific poet. All of Baudelaire's poetry fits into this book, which also has a lot of prose in it, and it has it in two languages. He, for all uh, purposes, wrote one book, The Flowers of Evil. Now, he revised that book as it went on for reasons that I'll explain to you. Baudelaire is extremely interesting for Catholics. You know, he is one of the most important and certainly most troubling Catholic writers in history. Both philosophers and theologians, especially in Europe uh, more than America, have been fascinated by Baudelaire for reasons that will become apparent when we talk about him. Interestingly, Baudelaire's father was a Catholic priest. Not something you can, you can say about many great poets. Uh, his father had been essentially an aristocratic chaplain before the Revolution. He was an extraordinarily cultured man. He was in aristocratic houses. He taught music. He taught painting. Everyone, you know, found uh, Père Baudelaire charming. The revolution came, and he was given, you know, really one of, of two choices, which is to leave the priesthood or to either suffer execution or transportation to a malarial French colony. You know, as you know, the French were determined to eradicate all aspects of Catholicism, you know, from the new Republique. He went into secular life. He married, I think it was one of his ex students. He got a very, he knew all the aristocrats and, you know, plus de change, plus de, uh, you know, même chose. You know, 10 years later, they were all in power. They were running the old bureaucracies. He became rather wealthy. And he had a child. He had a beautiful house in the medieval section of Paris. Then his wife died. And he then married a very respectable you know, woman without fortune. She was much, much younger than he was. And I think for her, it was like her one way you know, out of her life as a spinster. And they got married and they had a second child many years after the first who was Charles Baudelaire. His father died, and in a weird way, Baudelaire had this wonderful childhood for a few years. He loved his father, but you know, he had his mother to himself. If you, you know, if you read Baudelaire's life, you cannot help but psychically reach for copies of Sigmund Freud. And then she, mar- she met this immensely powerful, successful, dashing military officer who rose to the very highest levels of the French military and French politics, who was eventually General Opic. A Freudian drama emerged where he hated his father and fought with him for his mother. And from that moment on, you know, he essentially began a descent an emotional, a psychological descent that only ended in his death at 46. When he reached majority, he inherited a fortune that his father had left him. I mean, not an immense fortune, but enough, to, if he'd been uh, a good manager, to live on the rest of his life. Baudelaire was many things, but he was not a good manager of anything. He got a wonderful apartment in Paris. He furnished it with overpriced antiques and art, and he, going to the theater, spotted a, this attractive woman, you know, from the, the French colonies. You know, she was, prob- she was probably half African, you know, half 
French, and she became his mistress. Not surprisingly, within a few years, he had not only acquired you know, the habit of hashish, easy living, but he'd also acquired syphilis. And he went through his fortune, and finally his mother and his stepfather were so alarmed that they had a talking to. He didn't listen, of course. And then they took a court action to remove the remainder of his fortune and essentially infantilized him for the rest of his life. He was given this meager allowance that you know they would assume that would last till till he was forty, and then they decided that what he really needed, you know, because Opik is a man's man, he needed to have a sea voyage. So they put him on a boat to India. This was not a successful thing, and and Baudelaire eventually jumped ship in the Indian Ocean and came back to to uh, France unannounced and showed up at his home t- to their consternation. And he had announced that he wanted a literary career. He didn't want to be a lawyer the way his brother did. And so this is a man with enormous avenues of open to, you know to success in the highest you know levels of French society and he becomes god help all parents a bohemian. And he then you know starts to scrape by and this last you know the rest of his life ever more in an ever more seedy fashion. He reviews art, he d- he has the single most important meeting in his life, except for the meeting of his mistress, Jean Duval. And that is with, and I think it's a kind of substitute brother, because it's this person is about the same age as his older brother. And you'll be familiar with his name. It's, as the French say, Edgar Poe. In America, we call him Edgar Allan Poe, who was dead uh, and essentially was in disrepute. When Baudelaire read him, it was like Paul you know, uh, you know, on the road to Tarsus, uh, you know, he, he, it changed his life. This was the person that was going to guide him. In Baudelaire's collected works, the majority of the volumes are translations of Poe. He translated every scrap, but he didn't only did a few poems because he thought the poems were untranslatable. He begins writing and he publishes a book, Le Fleur du Mal, The Flowers of Evil. Bad Blossoms you, you, uh, would be one possible translation. It is a work of such extraordinary originality and genius that there's very few books in the history of poetry that ranks with it. He got a great publisher who did a beautiful edition, and Baudelaire drove everyone crazy by going over the proofs again and again and again, a behavior I would urge upon any writer. And it was published, it was immediately scan, you know, scandalous, and it was published at a particular moment in French history. There's a fellow you may have heard of named Gustave Flaubert. And he published a novel you may have heard of called Madame Bovary, Madame Bovary, which had been brought to trial as obscene. Because it's about a woman having an affair and about what's going on in her head. And it doesn't really pass much moral judgment you know, on Emma Bovary. And so he was brought to trial and he was to the horror of the conservative French Catholics acquitted. Now Baudelaire came uh, as the author of a book essentially praising evil, which has a whole section of poems that are about sex. They're you know, about sex, dare I say, outside the bonds of holy matrimony. Uh, and he's brought to trial. And, and Baudelaire, you know, is kind of goes crazy and is, you know, typically the bad defendant, and he is found guilty. But you know, the General Peak and his mother and all their aristocratic friends, they don't want to see this poor guy end up in jail. So he is, he and his, and the uh, publisher are fined and they, they excise. And I mean, they literally cut the pages for six poems, which are considered just beyond uh, scandalous. So Baudelaire, who has spent his life to produce a perfect book, it has a mystical number, it has a hundred poems plus one introductory poem. His masterpiece is quite literally mutilated. His reputation is now as the author of of obscene poems. He's even more penniless than before. And the fame that that he had hoped for, the literary fame that was justly deserved, is instead, you know, you know, he's, you know, sort of like Henry Miller or something like that. He's he's the smutty author. And he then 
needs to, you know, restore his masterpiece. So the rest of his life, he's re- adding new poems and rearranging this book so that he can achieve some perfection, but he can't bring the, the excised poems in, which are very beautiful and really, quite frankly, very dirty poems. The, and he finally dies without finishing it. But by the, his final years, he's, he's aged and the syphilis is, is turned him into an old man. You know, by the time he's in his late, late thirties, he finally ends up in, in Belgium and he loses the power of speech. His aged mother has to come to Belgium to, uh, to rescue him. He's put into a hospital run by nuns who are so offended by you know Baudelaire's language that he's kicked out. And his mother brings him back to Paris where he's put into a spa and with his holding his mother's hand, he dies at 46. By all objective measures, a man whose promising life was a complete failure. That being said, by the end of his life, other poets, uh, both in, the United, in England and France, discover him, and they recognize that Baudelaire has fundamentally changed the notion of poetry and the notion of aesthetics, and he becomes then the motivating force of the most influential poetic movement, it spills over into fiction and into painting as well, of the late 19th century, symbolism. It's impossible to define symbolism, you know, in under you know, probably 43 hours. What I would say is that think of the notion of writing poetry not to the rules of prose logic, but to the experiential rules of music. All art aspires to the conditions of music uh, is one of the phrases that they're, u- they're using on this. And so Baudelaire becomes, in a sense, and I, I just wrote it down in about, uh, you know, this morning, he does six things that changes the history of poetry, of literature, and art. The first thing is he finds a new way of writing poetry, which is the perfect uh, solution, which is half so radically new that you can't believe it, but is half embedded in the great tradition of European poetry, the, the, especially the history of, the, of, the, of French lyric poetry, going back to the Romans, really. So people can, rec- they can hear the magnificence of it, but they're appalled by what it's talking about. Uh, think of it in a very simple way. Uh, there's some langu- words that you think are poetic, some images you think are poetic, and some, some that are, are not. Baudelaire brings in a vocabulary, uh, a, a, a th- you know, a objects into poetry which have never been part of lyric poetry. They've been part of maybe a satiric poetry or comic poetry. Uh, it's everything from death, sex, bodily functions, squalor, evil, and these things. They exist, but they tend to exist in comedy or, or satire. He brings them into lyric high poetry. So the very vocabulary of poetry, and since words reflect things, the world that poetry reflects changes radically. But when you hear it, it sounds like the great French masters. And it's just shocking to people, you know, to have a, a, a poem which describes this truly predatory lesbian sex act, you know, in this kind of decadent room sounding like Racine, you know, the great Catholic, you know, poet, uh, you know, of the neoclassical period. The second thing that Baudelaire creates, and this is so pervasive that you take it for granted right now, even if you know nothing about poetry and you only follow rock music, he creates the image, the idea of the poet maudit, the cursed poet. He pulls this from from Edgar Allan Poe about you know, what a cursed poet is, and this is Jim Morrison, this is rap stars, this is James Dean, this is this is our cultural archetype of the artist, and I will offer it for myself. You know, you know, I'm I'm just too sensitive for this world. Don't, don't you think that? I mean, I'm just too sensitive, and part of it is also I'm so so gifted, and so it it hurts you. Hey, it hurts me ten times as much. <laughs> 
and, and am I going to complain? You better believe I'm going to complain, and that's going to be my work. And so you have this this thing of these people that are that are so talented and so visionary and in and, and such pain, but the pain and, and the vision give them insights into the world that you know ordinary people cannot possibly have. This is Sylvia Plath. This is Anne Sexton. And, and so he creates this thing, and this becomes almost today the general definition of the artist. You know, once I was very, uh, uh, had all these problems, and I was telling my mother, who had very little patience with artists and intellectuals, and she goes, you want to be an artist? You're supposed to suffer. <laughs> and, you know, and she didn't realize, but she was channeling Baudelaire. Now, as part of this, because he's describing things in poetry that aren't normally put in poetry, he has to redefine what beauty is. And curiously, his redefinition of beauty, I think, is so deeply Catholic that there's no way of avoiding it. That's why theologians go there. And what he's saying is that everything that exists, seen from the proper perspective, is beautiful. I don't think a theologian you know, can argue with that, but a theologian wouldn't want to kind of wallow quite in the muck and mire in the way that Baudelaire does. And doing this, and what do we, you know, what would a Catholic call this? An occasion of sin. That, you know, that, you know, we should see God in the most sordid things of the world, but it depends on uh, our understanding of it, depends on our perspective. But he is essentially articulates a thing, which is the beauty of evil. Now, Baudelaire's insights create what we think of as modernism. And it goes far beyond literature. It goes into the visual arts. It go, even, he's even in, in, influential on music. The other template is, is Walt Whitman. And Walt Whitman finds a way of essentially tying poetry with prophecy. Poetry, he says, well, you know, we don't believe in God anymore because we're all gods and we all get to write scripture. And so that becomes, you know, one uh, way for the modern artist to do he doesn't have the technical challenges. Baudelaire demands, you know, absolute technical perfection. So he creates this, and modern poetry begins to come out of this. But he also, because of what he's writing about, inspires Satanism, drug, decadence, and, uh, and you know, basically kind of, I wouldn't call it pornographic, but a, an obs- artistic obsession with sex and sexual aberration. And, you know, this is you know, part of how people understand him. They didn't call Baudelaire and the writers symbolists until many years later. They called them decadents. And indeed, some of them were, but not Baudelaire, because a decadent is somebody who has the, the forms of culture, the forms of behavior, or the forms of art with having lost the central value of it. And Baudelaire has the value. It just becomes a value that becomes essentially inverted because of, of Satanism. And then he does something else which is extremely important. He rescues Edgar Allan Poe from obscurity and thereby you know, creates a kind of culture that Poe creates. You know, Poe invents the modern horror story. He invents literally the detective story. He, you know, he you know, creates a kind of, of way of writing. Poe creates with Hawthorne and the notion of the modern short story, which is prose written to the aesthetic of lyric poetry. So so Baudelaire has just sent all of these things uh, into, the, into the world, and we have inherited the results. Sorry to be so long. No, no, that was wonderful, and you just beautifully set up so many of the questions that I wanted to ask you. But I, you know, coming out of the Catholic philosophical theological tradition, I want to not so much push back against, but ask you to further clarify this claim that you made that Baudelaire is trying to redefine beauty in a modern context, bring it back to the more medieval view, which I I tell my students, I just call it the convertibility thesis, right? So being, truth, goodness, beauty are just different aspects of being and describe our relations to being, right? And you said he, he's talking about the beauty of evil. And, you know, I'm, ju- I'm just wondering what that, what that really means and if, and if that really is what the convertibility thesis is, is trying to say. So it's you, also— you, you don't like being truth, badness, beauty. Uh, right. Yeah. 
Well, yeah, because and 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 it's really, I mean, it's a metaphysical thesis, well, no, right? He, so evil is a privation. It's a lack of what a nature, uh, what it pertains to a nature to have. So, so evil doesn't have being in its own. Thomas Aquinas says, any any time he talks about evil in the disputed questions on evil in either of his summas, he always says evil only exists in the good. It is ontologically and epistemically derivative. Yeah. Well, so uh, how can it be beautiful? Yeah, I, I, I don't disagree with you, but I will. Um, <laughs> Great. <laughs> here's the question, and you, you don't have to answer it, but maybe you want to answer it. Do you believe in damnation? Okay, so you know, most Catholics, however we qualify it, believe in damnation. We believe in sin. We believe... The wages of sin are death, and what you know, and that you, in a sense, are denied, you know, the ultimate gift of eternal life, or your, you know, your your eternal life is rather unpleasant, you know. And there's all kinds of debate about this because there's a certain ambiguity about what we know about this. But I think that it's impossible to understand what Baudelaire is doing without understanding damnation and his own notion of damnation. There's a, a very great French poet of the late Renaissance named Jacques Villon. And he's a thief, he's a murderer. We know very little about him, but everything we know about him is awful. Uh, and he's in prison, he's about to be killed, and he looks at his sins, and then he begins to write really funny poems about being a scoundrel. But also, you know, Virgin Mary, I'm, I'm, I'm giving up this life, save me. And so that's, that's the course in literature of damnation, of people, you know, Artists are notorious sinners, uh, but at, you know, towards the end, they get a little scared and they make, they ask for forgiveness in our sins. Baudelaire is perhaps, and I, 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 you know, I might be challenged. Perhaps the first great artist who decides, I'm damned. I mean, everything I do is going to is going to damn my soul. And whatever else he says, he believes in Christianity. Curiously, his Christianity, his Catholicism is deist, you know, rather than Trinitarian. You know, he's obsessed with the, in God the Father. He believes in God the Father so deeply that you can't understand his poetry without it. But he's, I'm damned, and he doesn't have a, he doesn't have a Christ. What he has instead is Edgar Allan Poe. He has a, the poet Modi that... You know, I am. What does Modi mean? It means cursed. You know, it, and so he develops this notion, which is that I'm damned. I'm a great poet, and so my subject will be about the experience of damnation. And in fact, there's even uh, you know one of his one of the suppressed poems is you know Femme damnée, uh, which is the you know the cursed women, the damned women. These are the this is the lesbian pair. And this is a poem which does not appear in French legally until after the after World War II. I mean, that's you know, you know, that's how effective the the censorship is. And so he decides to make an art of articulating the experience of damnation, which he nonetheless sees in the context of a divine plan. And so and that, I think, is theologically his escape clause. That's what theologians you know, have done, which is to say the experience of the damned, and Dante surely knew this, is no less real than the experience of the blessed. And then, in fact, it's probably more interesting to write about because there's really one way to salvation, which is through Christ. But, you know, there are a great many roads to hell. And most of you uh, of the audience today, I think, has traveled some of them, uh, we, but we won't get into that. So that's, that, I think, is this. There's a wonderful phrase that, that Baudelaire has in his notebook. He says, really, there's only three lives that are important, three people that are important in civilization, the priest, the soldier, and the poet, which is to say his father, his stepfather, and him. And, you know, so he... And that becomes theological in a, in a way. You know, he, there's this God the Father, and then there's his very, very prodigal son, Charles. And there's no redemption for him. There's no going back because the father's not there. There's only the stepfather. Yeah, I mean, again, it's, you know, you, you say it's, it's Catholic, but, it, but it, to me it's more like 
an inversion of Catholicism, yeah. right? It's like upside down Catholicism because, you know, it, I mean, the irony in the way that you describe him is that his damnation is his assumption of his damnation. That is to say it's his despair, right? Because it's true that Christ is the way, but what, you know, what is the path? And that would be faith, hope, and caritas, charity. And that is what you find utterly lacking in his poetry. I, I wouldn't say that Baudelaire qualifies as a devotional poet. You know, he's not George Herbert. But I, I do think that what Baudelaire offers is an exploration of things that Catholics believe but don't really want to look at much. And so, you know, I, it, and I think, you know, he's probably the kind of, of author that in, in an earlier age of Catholicism, you would have had to have the permission of your confessor to read. That being said, I think he is an extraordinarily moving and illuminating poet. Now, you're absolutely right about the inversion. Satanism, whether you're talking about a satanic mass or or you know you know basically demonology is always an inversion of the divine and you see that you know in their rituals and there's a very famous phrase diabolus simia dei the devil is the ape of christ you know the, of god and so and so what you see in in baudelaire is the this fact well, i am i'm cut off from grace but I, I understand the grace. I understand that God is there. I understand that there is a paradisial realm of existence, and I'm cut off from it. Now, he would be the first to admit that he's cut off from it because of the stuff he does. Because he's, you know, he's, I don't know of a single vice that, that Baudelaire did not have. I mean, it was available in 19th century France. He drank he smoked, he did opium, he smoked hash, you know, he, uh, he had illicit sexual relations. He was always high or low on something. I mean, he drank such enormous quantities of, of, of liquor. But what he's doing is saying that somehow, I think within this realm of damnation, he's doing div what he sees as divine work. He's illuminating it. And it gets into the idea and this is an idea which is, I think, very rightly uncomfortable for a Catholic. He's getting into the aestheticism that comes out of Poe. Poe is one of the greatest American authors, one of the most interesting thinkers, but there's something basically fuzzy about Edgar Allan Poe's theology. He's, he is nominally a Christian, but the, you know Christianity has no real meaning for Poe's work. And what Poe s sees is that we're in this mortal world, which is full of, you know, and, and Poe himself he had a life of unremitting suffering. He was very, nonetheless, productive and creative. That somehow what poetry does is to give you a glimpse of this empyrean, this celestial reign. And he talks about it's, it's the splendors after death. Gives us glimpses of this because it elevates our consciousness. Because once again, think of the poet Modi. In my antennae are bigger than yours. You know, I can t take perceptions that, that are not available to other people, and that Poe elevates us. And indeed, you know, Poe does. It was many and many a year ago in a kingdom by the sea that a maiden there lived, whom you may know by the name of Annabel Lee. And that maiden she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. I was a child, and she was a child in that kingdom by the sea, and we loved with a love that was more than a love, I and my Annabel Lee, a love that the winged seraphs of heaven coveted her and me. And now you don't even know who Annabel Lee is, but you were already, you feel the power of the love, you feel this elevation, you feel that even the angels are jealous of something that's, that is so uh, celestial as their love. And that's what Baud you know, Baudelaire is interested in doing. He doesn't have a, a Beatrice. He has a Jean Duval, who is, this is the kind of woman, she gets mad at you, so she poisons your cat. I mean, this is, uh, I mean, you know, she's not a nice gal, you know, uh, you know and, and she drinks, she takes drugs, and she just is 
fed up with him when he doesn't have money. And so they argue, they, they beat each other up. I mean, it's just a terrible pathological relationship that he has. And so that's what he, that's his access to the celestial realm. And so you can say as a Catholic, it's a doomed project, except the poems are beautiful. And what he does allow us to do is to see things that we would find initially repugnant, and especially in the 19th century, found terribly repugnant, and to understand the beauty in them, and however ineffectively to connect them to the divine. And, you know, and that brings me to, I see, see, I think the theological problem with Baudelaire is different perhaps than, than you do. I think his theological problem is that he doesn't have Christ. He doesn't understand that God created a redemptive system for the very situation that Baudelaire was in. And the funny thing about Baudelaire is that every other decadent, you know, French and in some cases English poet converted to Catholicism on their deathbed or their <laughs> their old age because they saw it as, you know, as basically ineffective in some ways. I mean, you can get poetry out of this, but you are damned. You know, your whole existence is, is pointless. But Baudelaire decides, should have been an Irishman, I think, uh, to see it through to the bitter end <laughs> well, and not ask for forgiveness. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because for me personally, the first time that I read Baudelaire, I read him in French. I was not a Catholic, right? I was an atheist the first time I read Baudelaire. And even then... Like, I could recognize, I was like, wow, this is, I don't know what this is, but this yeah. is amazing. But it made me very uncomfortable because the more you got into it, sort of like the darker it was getting. And I was like, man, I don't know what's up with this French guy. <laughs> but there's something, you know, there's something really off here. And by the time you get to the stuff about Satanism, even as an atheist, I was like, well, this is getting... Yeah. You know, like I'm, I want to get off this train. Yeah. Yeah, his and, litany to Satan is probably the most evil, great poem, you know, uh, you know, written in what I would say the Christian tradition. And so I think, yeah, you know, there are special worries or concerns that you're going to have as a Catholic. But I think just on the level of nature, I mean, take grace out of it. There's something very dark about his vision and... So, so you talked about being the cursed poet, but let's talk about how he thinks of poetry. So in your wonderful introduction uh, to this new translation of The Flowers of Evil, you talk about how Baudelaire thinks of poetry as enchantment or as casting a spell on the one hand, but you also say, on the other hand, that he thinks of poetry as aimed at beauty, you know, nothing other than beauty, and that beauty heightens or deepens our perception so that we can experience reality or see reality or appreciate reality in a new way. And I was just wondering, well, how could it be both? Because when I think of being under a spell, I think of like, to me, it has no connotation with having a deeper connection to reality. It's sort of like fantasy or something. And that's a brilliant question. Uh, and I think, let me say f two things about the questions you've asked. The most important issue that Catholics, and I mean not just Catholic artists or intellectuals, that Catholics face is the restoration of beauty. Our civilization has lost the traditional connection with beauty and, and beauty's connection with truth. And Catholicism has stood more or less idly by. We have lost, in a sense, the way that we make our truths incarnate, accessible, and human. That failing has crippled the church, and it's outside of the church, it's crippled our society. But I think the spell of poetry, so you, th I think people think, you know, I'm going to put you under spell, and now you will go and kill Dr. Runson, you know. No, what this is, what Baudelaire, Baudelaire, in a sense, you know, what, why did Plato you know, hate poets. And it's because you can't control the outcome. You get, you know, people revved up in hearing this poetry because, you know, to them, poetry is, you know, is, you know, is like a, a rock concert. You know, they get revved up and who knows what they're going to do. 
And so it's the, uh, the unpredictability of the outcome, which is fundamental to art. If I, if my, you know, this is, and this is the mistake that religious literature makes. You know, they go, I want a good book that leads young people to good behavior. You know, uh, this is, you know, art operates differently. What art does, it's an excitation. We go through life armored. We can't get through one day of our life without shutting down about 90% of our perceptive capability. You just have to say, well, I just got to get through this sermon. I'm not, I mean, I'm going to, I'm not going to listen. You know, I just got to, you know, think good thoughts, you know? And so you're, you're armored and you're just trying to protect yourself. What art does is to take the armor off and have you, you can say, approach one moment of your existence with vulnerability, but I tend to think of it with complete openness, that you're going to connect what you see to your imagination, to your memories, to your physical body, to your complete humanity. And that is an experience in which you cannot predict the outcome. Because if somebody's trying to control you, with, you know, with Soviet realism, you know, uh, this, that, or the other, you don't want to go there because you're actually, you know, you're kind of seeing reality and you don't, don't want to be, you know, herded towards one conclusion. And so what Baudelaire does is essentially reconnect poetry with its ancient function, which is to cast a spell, which brings, and, I, and I'll go one step further, which not only excites your senses, but makes you open to the divine. Now, he, you could say that he makes you open th- through the divine, th- you know, from the back door, you know, from, you know, the, or the exit, you know, f- you know, away from the divine, but you're getting a glimpse of this. And so he has this tremendous power. And the beauty of Baudelaire is that you know, he, he does not, and this is so different from all the writers who came before him, in, especially in French, he does not want to control the outcome. And that is, I think, the defense I would make by saying, well, you know, he's bad for us to read. Because what he's doing is, you know, he's showing us the beauty and evil, but he's con- also showing us the consequences of evil. There's a very famous poem here. We should probably mention that this book we're talking about is The Flowers of Evil. It's translated by Aaron Pachigian, and, and it was published by Liverite. And it's, it's a really superb new translation of Baudelaire. I mean, and, Puchigian is a one of the you know is a really very fine poet uh, in his own right. So, you know, I think it is that musical, magical, you could say ultimately mystical function of poetry, which is originally a sacred art. It, it, poetry is created to connect humanity with the divine, to create rituals, you know, that tell us the stories of the gods and tell us the stories of things. And and Baudelaire does that, but he subverts it and. I think that Baudelaire himself understood this. He made several statements about that his work is moral because it sh- the, shows you the consequences of sin. Yeah, I, so I completely agree that art should not, shouldn't be didactic either politically or morally. Like it's not the point. However, I, I'm very sympathetic with, with a tradition that says you know, that beauty is connected to truth and goodness, not evil. And that great art is going to reveal various things. And of course, you shouldn't try to control your reader, right? Because your reader has to bring him or herself to the art and that's on them, right? The artist is just creating the work, right? And 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 I guess I just yeah, it's not it's not so much that I want to say because I don't want to say that reading Baudelaire is bad or you shouldn't read Baudelaire, but I do think that his vision, right, is is crucially an error in various respects. And this comes out in the poetry. Yeah, right? well, I you know, I, I yes and no. Who are Baudelaire's children? T.S. Eliot, Paul Claudel, the great uh, Christian poets of the 20th century are the, for the most part, you know, the, the inheritors of Baudelaire. So, you know, you have to sort of say so there's something else going on there. And I, I agree with you. You know, you'd call him, you know, a, a poet dangerous. You know, he's dangerous. And, but if you start to read Baudelaire's poetry, and this is where he's so crucial to modernism, you realize that 
most of the great poems have multiple interpretations. You cannot, you know, if I don't know if you, I don't think anybody in the United States much reads neoclassical French poetry, which is very great. I mean, Racine, uh, you know, Cornier, these are fantastic poets, but they're rhetorical, they're moral, they're making essentially moral arguments through rhetoric. And Baudelaire takes that with a sledgehammer and smashes it to little pieces. And what he's doing is he's giving you an experience which is troubling, but is mesmerizing. You know, through the, you know, once again, it's the power of the traditional poetry and the appalling nature of the new subject matter. And he's bringing you into it and he's not giving you an answer. And I think that, you know, that it's, that is what certainly that Elliot says. But let me just start with a, with a pull off from literature. How many people that are hearing us find the, the, the details of their daily life beautiful as they drive to work, as they go into to the office or they stare at a screen? How, think of this as beautiful. Okay, well, you know, there's something, you know, I think it is because I live in the country, but most people don't. And especially the poor in urban neighborhoods at the end of the 19th century, they, f- they found their daily existences quite ugly. And what art does, what poetry does, is to redeem the, the everyday world for the imagination and for the soul. To, to find the beauty in it. I think that's the wisdom of Catholicism. Our greatness is that we see joy and suffering, you know, and we have terrible, terrible things that happen to us. And it takes us years to understand, I lost my first child. And it was the most painful and destructive thing that ever happened to me. But I understand the gifts of that suffering. I understand the transformation that that suffering requires. You know, that as Seneca said, if we resist destiny, it drags us behind us. If we follow it, it guides us. And so this is, and what Baudelaire did was to give modern poets the mechanisms by which they could take the troubling aspects of their daily life. And this is, even if it's perfectly moral, you know, church-going, poor French, you know, uh, men and women, that to in a sense, to redeem the, the urban world for the imagination. And so, the, you know, the imagine, and, and that's still an imaginative project. You know, we, you know, we see it in contemporary filmmakers, we can see it in poets and, and novelists. But you're right, Baudelaire's solutions do not, did not work for him in his personal life, and they don't work for him in theology. But, you know, sometimes by seeing, uh, in a sense, understanding mistakes, we grow wise. That is certainly the message of Dante's Inferno, that only by looking and understanding every form of evil, every possible way that humanity can go wrong, do we understand the nature of redemption. And so, you know, in, in Dante's drama of redemption, it begins in sin. So what you're really saying is that perhaps a poet who died at 46, who is this you know, uh, we only get the Inferno. We don't get the Purgatorio and the Paradiso. But, you know, by their bad fruits shall we know them, you know. And, and, and Baudelaire is simply a great poet, full of terrible ideas, but full of magnificent perceptions. And if you look at the, because you were talking, wanted to talk about a couple of poems. This, you know, as Baudelaire arranged and rearranged this book. You know, he, he saw only one expanded edition, you know, published almost towards the end of his life. And then his publisher in Belgium was able to reprint the dirty poems because they were, you know, free from French law. And they added a few things. But Baudelaire ends this book, you know, which is his only book. I mean, how many, you know, uh, truly world-changing poets have only one book? I mean, it's just, it's, this is almost... I think with this very, very strange poem uh, called Voyaging, uh, which is, you know, a very, very difficult poem, Le Voyage in, in French. And it's about getting on this boat, this great ship, and what you realize as you're going on, this is the ship of death. This is taking you from life into death, into the afterward. And what he ends the book on is, 
is essentially a beatific vision. You know, he's imagining his way, you know, out of this hellish life in a way that he can't possibly. So you could take that as a literary critic and say, well, putting something at the very end of a masterpiece does have an enormous effect on the masterpiece because that is the conclusion. And so, you know, it's a very strange, you know, the, the book, it just the sections and he first, it has a, a very famous poem to the reader, which lies outside the text. It's a preface. When he had a hundred poems, which was, you know, 10 times 10, it was the perfect number. And then he had one, the in, basically the, the number, the indivisible number in prefacing it. He has that preface. Then he has this thing called spleen and ideal. Now, spleen is a is a portion of your body, but what what we would call it today is like, you know, self hatred and depression, and so it's about, and this is his view of the, you know, the contemporary life that you're you're just depressed, you're alienated, this awful stuff, and yet you have the ideal, this sense of of a perfect life, of the afterlife, of God, of the divine. And so he sets up a dualism. And, and this is the great, I think in some ways, the greatest section of the book. It's the longest section. And all these famous moments. Then he has this, the set, you know, he creates in a later edition, the second thing called Parisian Scenes, you know, where he just describes everyday urban life in Paris. This is so influential in contemporary literature because it gives poets the language by which they then describe urban existence. Then he has the worst section of the book, which is called Wine. Uh, which is just, you know, which is like, I think he was, you know, probably inebriated when he wrote most of these things. And then he has the most uh, controversial one, which is The Flowers of Evil. And this is basically about, about sex and sex and, vi- and sexual violence, you know. And so, you know, and once again, this is extremely important that, you know, the question is, should a poet write about sex? And I think, you know, poets throughout the ages have said, yeah, you know, can't talk about that. There's not much left, is there? You know, that this is an entry point. It's, you know, it's this, it's this, this carnal ecstasy. He has that. These are the poems that were, mo- for the most part, excised. Then he has, I think, another bad section, although I'm in a minority probably, it's called Revolt. And this is where you get angry at God and you reject him. So it's it's St. Peter's denial, you know, saying that was a really good thing. There's... Uh, Cain and Abel, where he comes out, out on, the, on the side of Cain, and then it ends with just three poems, the litanies of Satan. So it's three heretical, purposely blasphemous poems. Then he has death, which is kind of, you know, very, very dark and kind of thing. And then death ends with this poem called you know, Le Voyage, The Voyage. So, you, you know, you look at this thing, the book ends with death corruption, damnation, and a, a vision of basically human redemption through, the, you know, through beauty and through the imagination. So I think it's a void. I, you know, it's not as comprehensive as Dante's trip, but it's an interesting trip, even if it mostly takes place in Paris. Well, let's, I mean, let's talk about imagination and how he's thinking of imagination in relation to poetry and like what is, you know, feeding his imagination. I mean, he's raised Catholic, I I assume. And there's well, it, there is a priest, for God's yes, sakes. Well, <laughs> yes. an ex-priest. Ex-priest. But and no, no, but an ex-priest who was for, who was forced out of his, his his vocation. That's right. So yeah, can we I just want to invite you to talk a little bit more about his imaginative vision. You know, he has this, this, what his genius is, I think, in a lot of ways, is to actually bring you into a scene and recreate the scene where you can feel the scene in, uh, and the music of it casts a spell, but he doesn't tell you where to go. And this is what modern poets loved. This is why modern poetry is more difficult. Because, you know, we know, you know, when we're reading Shakespeare, you know, let's say the sonnets, However rich, however ambiguous they are, there is a stated ending, you know, and, and we have to take that as a departure point for any Baudelaire, there's usually not an ending. There's a narrative ending, but there's not a moral ending for, you know, for a lot of these poems. And sometimes he just, is a very, uh, the, talk about the opening poem, you know, this is to the reader, au lecteur, in which essentially, you know, usually a reader, you know, you'd say, oh, gracious reader, dear reader, 
you know, I will take you on this. You know, this tends to be a formal poem that most people skip. Think of Catullus, you know, to whom do I dedicate this small volume of my poems? To you, Lepidus, who in, you know, four, I don't forget how many number, in four weighty volumes, you know, examine the history of Rome. And I hope that my work pleases you. What Baudelaire does is basically insult his reader and say, you are just the contemptible, disgusting, you know, you know person. And you're worse than Satan in this because you, ha- you control all these vices and you're hypocritical. And, and, and we live in a world, he goes, the devil, guides, you know, the devil guides us like a puppet master. Disgusting objects please us very well. Each day we take another step toward hell, unflinching through the putrid lack of luster. In just the way some broke debauchee kisses and nips an old whore's martyred tit. We steal in passing off-limits delights and squeeze it like a seasoned orange dry. Now, I would say that that does not give us an attractive view of illicit sex. And yet it, you know, is probably a reasonable depiction of an old debauchee who can't, you know, afford, you know, the, with the fruit there, as the French call it, you know, younger women. And so finally, and he goes, and he goes, you know, so there's this horrible world we live in that's ruled by Satan. It's full of these monsters and these disgusting figures. But there's one thing worse than anything else. There among all the jackals, panthers, mutts, monkeys and vultures, scorpions and snakes, those howling, yelping, grunting flocks and packs, the infamous menagerie of our rots. There's one most ugly, false and dirty birth Though hardly moving, uttering no grand sound, he gladly makes a shambles of this land and yawning swallows the entire earth. So what's the worst thing in the world? What's the greatest evil in the whole world? What's the thing that really corrupts everyone? And it's, it's very interesting. It's, it's, what the, it's, it's the same thing that the existentialists come up with because they've read Baudelaire. Boredom. You know, boredom, moist-eyed, he dreams while pulling on a hookah pipe of guillotine cleft necks. This is modern America. This is somebody watching a screen. They're, it's a drug. They like to see violence. They like to see sex. They indulge in a thing. And it's just a way of curing their boredom. You, reader, know this tender freak of freaks. And it's hypocrite uh, reader, mirror man, my twin. Brilliant translation by Puchigian. You know, but, but the French is, you know, uh, hypocrite lecteur, mon semblable. Mon frère, you hypocritical reader, you know, like you think you're, worse, you're as bad as anybody else, and you're just like me. You're my brother. So, I mean, no book in history ever had an introduction like that. And he doesn't disappoint you for there. So, it's about recognition of our own corruption. And what, what Baudelaire's other insight is, and you, you can say, well, uh, you know, as Catholics, this is exactly what we find. This is why the, the, the little way of St. Teresa is so important, is that we, in a sense, we find meaning in the dailiness of our lives. We find meaning in the small things. But Baudelaire is actually on, is, was the prophet of what's really happened in our age. People are bored and they fill it with all the vices and the, uh, of, of dark fantasy. And, and that's what he's really doing, because he does not have redemption. So he's got uh, an increasingly intolerable existence that you have to create. And he, this is a phrase that he creates, artificial paradises, drugs, liquor, sex, and you know, things like that that give you temporary res- respite from the boredom that crushes down on your life of a meaningless urban existence. Now, you can say, like, that's not me. And I'm Mr. Positive. I'm never bored. And some of us, I think that's probably quite true of. But the great mass of humanity, a hundred plus years later, is under the situation that Baudelaire was the very first great artist to describe. And however uncomfortable we are with his heritage, with all the downside, with the tragedy of his own life, he was the prophet of the internet age. Uh, of the age of prescription drugs, of all of these things like that. And, you know, like it or not, we have to deal with, his, with the downside of his legacy as well as its magnificence.
Yeah, I mean, you talked about Baudelaire's children, and, and you mentioned poets like Claudel, but I mean, I think one of Baudelaire's children is Albert Camus. It really reminds me so much of Camus, you know, when he's when he's talking about this kind of longing for transcendence and this idea that, well, it's never going to be met. That's Camus, yep. right? That's Camus' starting point. That's Camus' Sisyphus, right? I mean, Camus' Sisyphus, in a way, is damned, but what Camus says that's so remarkable is that we have to imagine Sisyphus happy, yep. right? I don't think Baudelaire is saying that. I mean, I don't think he's asking us to make that extra move to say, oh, yeah, you know, here, here in the muck and the mire, yeah, this is, yeah. This is authentic happiness. Yeah, I, think that, that's, I mean, I, I agree with everything you said. I mean, if you think about this, every French poet, Belgian, most uh, European poets after Baudelaire essentially are dealing with this problem. It becomes the you know the central problem of European poetry, and and it's it's the same thing. And it becomes the existentialists come out of Baudelaire. And they write about, but they're obsessed with, obsessed with Baudelaire. But if you look at this, you know what does Kierkegaard say about it? escape? Because you know he's what what Kierkegaard is writing is the same thing, which is the aesthetic life. If you're doing a life that's about pleasure, about you know physical existence, about beauty, how do you find meaning? And although Kierkegaard never used the term, you know, it's implicit in his work, the existential leap. You know, you've got, and so what's the existential leap in, in Baudelaire? It's the revolt. You know, you, you throw away God, you embrace Satan, which is unfortunately the answer of a lot of existentialism. You know, that, you know there's the Christian existentialists, and then there's the kind of, you know, the neant, as they call it in French, you know, the, the, the nihilistic side of it. And, and Baudelaire is a kind of, of, he backs himself into a corner, you know, where he has, he's essentially nihilistic. You know, he dresses it in Satanism, but, you know, he, the fact is that what makes Baudelaire maddening is that he knows the escape. You know, he, you know, he knows, but he, you know, he can't do it. And I think it's also, it's a problem. Let's, let's, let's talk, you know, let's talk real theology now. You know, if you... It's the problem with uh, with a Unitarian view of God. I mean, I think almost everybody in the world believes in some greater force that's guiding existence and creation. You know, you might a scientist might define it some way. Certainly, Catholics define it in a very different way. But if you just if you, what you have is kind of a general sense that there's a divine, there's a general vague sense that there's an afterlife, and you don't have a redemptive figure, you're doomed. And I think that that's been the the problem with those branches of Christianity that have become Unitarian, that that lasts for maybe one generation because it doesn't, you know, it doesn't create the grace that's necessary to redeem the fallen nature of man. Baudelaire is the the bard of you know of the fallen nature. I mean, that's that's where he begins and, and he ends, and that's that's what the existentialists do is that they have this revolt. Which is a, a usually a movement against against any sense of the divine, and that and they they inherit that. But we don't, as Catholics, we we don't agree with this. But I don't think we should be scared of imagining it. You know, I think that that's you know that you know we have to we have to imagine the damnation as as well as redemption. I think perhaps one of the weaknesses of contemporary uh, Catholicism is that we've turned away from it. I mean, I, I made a, a comment in an article I published in First Things about six weeks ago called Christianity and Poetry, that Vatican II was really quite embarrassed by the Last Judgment and by hell. You know, it just, just wasn't the positive spin, you know, that we want to put on the new church. And so they one of the, th- the things that they... They basically dropped the Dies Irae, you know, one of the greatest single poems in the Christian tradition, not just the Catholic tradition, one of the masterpieces, Dies Irae, Dies Ila, Solvet Seclum in Favila, Teste David Cum Sibila, Day of Wrath, that terrible day when heaven and earth shall pass away, as Sibyl and the prophets say. And it creates this vision of what the Last Judgment is, about the the essentially that even the just will be insecure which is that seems to me the basic you know 
this is like one of the most virtuous women in the world. I'm one of the greatest sinners, but we're more or less equal by God's because we're both, you know, we're both imperfect and both of us equally need redemption. And that's, you know, I think that's the inside of that poem. So they ban this. And, you know, 50 years later, what's the general, the most absorbing thing to the young? It's the apocalypse, it's the resurrection of the dead, it's zombie muse, it's post-apocalyptic. They're fascinated with this because their culture does not acknowledge, their Christian culture does not acknowledge it nor give them guidance on it. And so, you know, the aggiornamento of the Catholic Church, you know, bringing it up to date actually, I think, made it almost immediately outdated. And so what, you know, Baudelaire is giving you is a diaz ire. Yeah. I mean, I think it's interesting. Young people really love sacred music. I mean, they're just so attracted to it. And my 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 daughter, Gianna, my oldest daughter, they sang Dies Irae at um, their last choral performance. And just all these teenagers thought it was like the most amazing thing yep. ever. And they're like, have we never heard this? Yep. You know, we, we killed our number one hit. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, but uh, these things, that art, you know, see, theologians are always uncomfortable about art. Because it, it can be used in ways they don't like. I mean, and I think the glories of Catholicism is they put naked people in chapels, you know, and as if, you know, as if God made a mistake in designing our bodies that we should be embarrassed by them. And so, you know, you look at, and, and that's the magnificence of all of the depictions of the Last Judgment. The depictions of the Last Judgment inevitably have sinners stripped naked. And, and we see the, the deformities that sin has given them. And the, and the blessed are robed in radiant garments. And I think that there's a, there's a kind of physical, you know, way that, that we feel this, you know. And, and you see it in Michelangelo's Last Judgment, but you see it in all Last, last Judgments. And every religion has the gods above and the gods below. It has the gods of light and the gods of darkness. You know, Christianity, and, uh, you know, we have, in a sense, been given the true gods and the false gods, you know, the power of light and the dangers of darkness. And if we sort of say, well, we're going to talk about the dark stuff because, you know, it's going to upset you or it's going to be dangerous, and then you throw a kid out into the world, they're lost because, you know, right away they're going to be met both by the monster boredom and by all of the corrupting pleasures of the world. All pleasures are good in the proper context. All pleasures are dangerous and are taken out of the context. I mean, something as simple as eating, you know, becomes a you know, horrible vice. Drinking, you know, which is Jesus' first miracle, you know, you know, can lead to alcoholism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, we have to, in a sense, guide people. That's why Dante is the most influential poet on modern poetry, because it's the most complete account of our existence. Uh, James, I, I was reading a, a Catholic World Report the other day. There was an article about the conference. I don't know if you've seen it. I began reading it. I said, God damn, this is a good article. Who the hell wrote it? Of course, it was James Wilson. Uh, you know, and, and you know, James has a you know, wonderful thing where he talks about uh, like most Catholics do, they after about two paragraphs of art, they get bored and they move into pure theology because they always wanted to theologize uh, artwork because they're a little uncomfortable about naked people in chapels. They, he says, you know, Catholicism essentially is the most complete and plausible account of our existence, and that's that's what we have to do. But we have to give people the complete account. We can't just give them, you know, the either the Reader's Digest version or the, the sanitized yeah. version. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I, this will be the the final word just because of time. But yeah, and and I and I think American Catholicism in in particular has a special struggle with the role of beauty and art, and I think that's just because we've been placed in this Protestant context where we're, we're sort of defensive or well, we're put in a defensive posture. And yeah, you know, I wonder how many people in our audience had rich grandparents. How many people in our audience had grandparents who spoke English? You know, and you know what. American Catholicism is, are some of the poorest people in the world dumped into a Protestant nation that hated them and constantly tried to make Catholicism I illegal. You know, I mean, I have, there's a, you know, a line that I have, you know, I'm, you know, let's say if I get quoted, uh, you know, read it last night, which is, talk about myself, you know, I praise my ancestors 
the unkillable poor, the few who escape disease or despair, the restless, the hungry, the stubborn, the scarred, let us praise the dignity of their destitution. That's American Catholicism. And so the priests were just trying to keep people fed, trying to teach them to read. My grandmother, whom I was raised next door in Los Angeles, was illiterate. She couldn't even sign her own name. This is the, you know, the, the class of Sicilians that came. She was a smart woman, but she had no education whatsoever. And so Catholicism here has had to deal with that. And beauty was just deemed an unnecessary luxury. If you had enough money, you made a church that looked like it was in Europe. But most pastors to this day get their art from a catalog. And, uh, and so we've broken it. So our challenge, I think, you know, in, you know I'm, I'm an old man now. But the challenge of my generation, which we failed, we failed abysmally, but now as the younger generation I'm hopeful for, which is why we've created this Catholic conference, is to recreate the language of beauty and reunite it with faith. Well, on that note, uh, please join me in thanking Dana for joining the podcast. You have been listening to Sacred and Profane Love, a philosophy, theology, and literature podcast that is generously underwritten by the Institute for Human Ecology at the Catholic University of America and produced by Catholics for Hire, a group of young Catholic digital content freelancers. Special thanks, as always, goes to Will Dethridge, Bea Quasi, and Joe Coleman for their work in editing and producing this podcast. If you enjoy this podcast, please consider giving us a positive review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to us. You can also support us by becoming a monthly patron at patreon.com slash eudaimoniapod. Patrons enjoy many benefits like tote bags and coffee mugs with exclusive artwork and also free digital subscriptions to either The Lamp or The Point magazine. For our next episode, I will be joined by the philosopher Sam Philby, to discuss J.M. Coetzee's novel, Elizabeth Costello. Until then, friends, be well and keep reading.